A few years ago, I realized that the whole intelligent design controversy is not a scientific issue at all, but a political one. This goes a long way towards explaining why intelligent design has gotten as far as it has. The problem is that scientists keep approaching it as though it were a scientific issue. So we make our observations, do experiments, and write our papers, showing repeatedly that all the evidence is in favor of evolution. Then we publish our papers in scientific journals where they are read by other scientists. I think you see the problem here. <laughs> Unfortunately, the people who are likely to be persuaded by intelligent design arguments don't read scientific journals, and they never will. We have libraries full of evidence for evolution, and most people don't know it. So doing more research won't make a difference. What will make a difference is treating this as a political issue. Political arguments are different. Political arguments must be short, easy to understand, memorable, and preferably entertaining. In my case, I want them to be true as well. So I started looking for new approaches. And inspiration finally hit me in the middle of an anatomy and physiology lecture when I was lecturing about reproductive systems. And this is why my first argument against intelligent design in the human body is the male testicle. This brings me to the alternative title for this evening's lecture. <laughs> you notice there's a subtle difference here. I realized that this was just the sort of thing I needed for a political style argument because once I started talking about men's testicles, people would pay attention. <laughs> so without further ado, here are the problems with men's testicles. The testicles hang outside the body in a sack of skin called the scrotum. Why? <laughs> because human body temperature is too hot for sperm production. Having normal body temperature be too hot for sperm production is bad design. <laughs> so the testicles have to hang outside the body in the scrotum, thereby putting a vulnerable organ in a vulnerable place. Putting a valuable and vulnerable organ in such a vulnerable location is bad design. <laughs> they are cut to all sorts of inconvenience and risk severe pain and worse because of this unfortunate positioning. One would think that God could do better. Here's a picture of how all this is put together. Notice how the testicles, with their inability to be warm and productive at the same time, hang outside, while all the abdominal organs are safely tucked up inside out of harm's way. Our cold-blooded relatives don't have this problem, and their sperm-making equipment is safely inside them. If you don't believe me, try to find the balls on a frog. <laughs> you won't manage it unless you do a dissection. <laughs> Here's a picture of a frog's insides. See, a frog's testicles are safe inside him where a vulnerable organ ought to be. Does this mean that the so-called creator likes frogs better than men? Or does it mean that as humans evolved, the ones who had their balls hanging outside reproduced better? You decide. This brings me to my primary reason for why evolution explains the human body so much better than intelligent design does. The standards for evolution are much lower. The standard for systems that evolve is good enough to not cause death before reproduction too much of the time. <laughs> the standard for intelligent design is designed by an infallible creator. You can see the difference. Believe me, as an anatomy and physiology professor, evolution explains human anatomy far better than any notion of a good designer. 
Human bodies are just too badly put together to stand up to even reasonable design specifications, much less infallible ones. While we are on the subject of bad design, here is a picture of a baby crowning. This is the part of childbirth where a baby's head has to fit through a circle of bone that is smaller than the head is. I've colored in the bony parts of the woman's pelvis here. They're the parts in red. It isn't a good fit. Here's a picture of the whole birthing sequence. As before, I've colored in the bone. You can see how the baby's head has to be squeezed pretty hard to fit through this bottleneck. And as we all know, in the old days, this frequently killed the woman, the baby, or both. These days, we often avoid the birth canal altogether and perform cesarean sections. These are being done in ever-increasing numbers. One would think that a benevolent creator would not make childbirth into such a problem in the first place. In fact, there are simple things that could have been done better if only we had been designed rather than evolved. Let me explain. The main problem from a design standpoint is that we walk upright while being very smart. These two attributes have opposing requirements. Walking upright favors people with narrow hips, which makes walking much easier and more efficient. Being smart, on the other hand, requires large heads. Large heads require large birth canals. Large birth canals require wide hips. Now, a wise creator could have solved this engineering problem easily by doing something like this. <laughs> Look, the baby develops outside the body of its bipedal mother in a nice comfy pouch complete with a nipple for nursing. Animals like kangaroos give birth to very small, embryo-like young that are placed in a pocket on the outside of the mother's body. This is where they continue their development. That's the way to do it if you're going to be a biped. So why didn't the Creator do that for us? It's simple. We evolved rather than being designed. Women's hips are narrow enough that they can walk because any woman who couldn't walk would die before she could reproduce. Most women's hips are wide enough, on the other hand, that children can be born most of the time. The end result is an uneasy compromise that doesn't work very well and is very hard on some individuals. This was clearly not done by any intelligent creator. If this is the best that the Creator can do, then the Creator has a lot of explaining to do. Now I'll stop talking dirty to you for a while and I'll bring up choking instead. <laughs> Here's a picture of the inside of the human throat. This is another example of really bad design. Our air passages and food passages meet and mix, sometimes with fatal results. I've colored the parts where air gets inhaled in blue. I've colored the parts where food gets ingested in red. The places where both food and air go are at the mouth and at the pharynx further down. Most of the time, the air <coughs> passing through the pharynx gets funneled into the windpipe or trachea. And most of the time, the food and water passing through the pharynx gets funneled into the esophagus leading to the stomach. But not always. Sometimes food or water wind up in the windpipe, as anyone who has ever inhaled cracker crumbs can tell you. Sometimes larger pieces of food get into the windpipe this way and get stuck there, blocking breathing. Here's what that looks like. In these cases, if the Heimlich maneuver or some other means of removing the blockage isn't performed very quickly, then the victim will die of asphyxiation. There are hundreds of cases like this every year. Many of these result in the premature deaths of otherwise healthy people. A better designed system would keep the tubes for air and food separate to avoid 